بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم عنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك أما بعد The title of the chapter chapter 32 in the book of the softeners of the heart كتاب الرقاق is باب الأعمال بالخواتيم وما يخاف منها الأعمال بالخواتيم meaning deeds and actions are judged by their conclusions are valid or they lack validity based on their conclusions وَمَا يُخَافُ مِنْهَا and what you fear and worry, what you worry about when it comes to the conclusions of the deeds meaning a deed or a series of deeds are not simply enough until you see how you end that deed. How does it conclude? Similarly, a one's life. And that is easier to understand, but it has the same meaning. That one's life, like if you at this moment, is righteous. That's not enough in itself until you see what? How you die. Upon what do you die? Is it upon Islam or not? Is it upon righteousness or not? So as we, if when we want to judge a person's life, we look at the conclusion of it to see where he goes, the validity of an action or a deed, and the sum of that is one's life, is to look at how that deed concludes. And that gives us an insight into how that deed is and was. And the hadith, insha'Allah, will make it clear. It says here that نظر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى رجل يقاتل المشركين. He looked and he saw صلى الله عليه وسلم a man who was fighting the non-believers. So that tells you that this is a battle. The Muslims were at one of those battles. It doesn't specify. One of those battles. And he looked at someone, a Muslim, the army of Muslims was fighting who? The polytheists, the disbelievers. وَكَانَ مِنْ أَعْظَمِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ غَنَاءً عَنْهُمْ He was among the Muslims who were fighting the non-believers. He was the most accomplished, the bravest. وَأَكْثَرُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ غَنَاءً عَنْهُمْ Meaning that he fought so many of the non-believers that he sufficed other Muslims from fighting them. You follow what, I'm, what it says there? That is, he fought one, and then he fought the other, and then he fought the other, and then if he, he was able to neutralize one person, then that's one less person that the other Muslims have to fight. So he protected most Muslims by how brave he was. So meaning, he was the most accomplished when he was fighting. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ So the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَحَبَّ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ فَلْيَنْظُرْ إِلَىٰ هَذَا He says, if someone would like to see one of the people of hellfire, let him look at that person. فَتَبِعَهُ رَجُلٍ So a man followed that man, the one who was fighting so heroically, the one whom the Prophet ﷺ said that he's going to be where? And hellfire. He followed him. فَلَمْ يَزَلْ عَلَى ذَلِكَ He continued to fight valiantly. حَتَّى جُرِحْ Until he was injured. So that one who was fighting so heroically was injured. قَالَ فَاسْتَعْجَلَ الْمَوْتِ He rushed death. He couldn't wait. He panicked. فَقَالَ بِذُبَابَةِ سَيْفِهِ فَوَضَعَهُ بَيْنَ ثَدْيَيْهِ So he took the blade of his sword. He put it between his breasts, on his, on his chest. فَتَحَامَلَ عَلَيْهِ He leaned on it حَتَّى خَرَجَ مِنْ بَيْنِ كَتِفَيْهِ Until the, that blade exited from his shoulders, from his back. Meaning he did what? Suicide. He killed himself. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَيَعْمَلُ فِيمَا يَرَى النَّاسُ عَمَلَ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ وَإِنَّهُ لَمِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ He says a person would perform the deeds of the people of Jannah as far as people could see. But he is from the people of hellfire. وَيَعْمَلُ فِيمَا يَرَى النَّاسُ عَمَلَ أَهْلِ النَّارِ وَهُوَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ And he does 
seemingly the deeds of the people of hellfire as far as people could see. And he is of the people of Jannah. وَإِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِخَوَاتِيمِهَا And indeed, actions are but by their ends and conclusions. Meaning how they end is the most significant part that tells you about whether this thing was valid or not and overall whether this life was righteous or not. Now, this hadith is really an important hadith because there are so many lessons in it. And each of them is powerful and each of them is important. And in trying to understand this hadith, we have to understand at the same time that this thing that we've read in about two minutes or so really summarizes an entire event at the time of the Prophet wasallam. that spending only two minutes with it doesn't serve it justice. So we have to admit like when you're reading the hadith, and even when you're reading the Qur'an, there is a gap, right? Because this entire thing was given in what? Summarized in two minutes. Did it take two minutes for this to happen? No. This is a battle. So for you to try to bridge some of this gap, you have to spend more time with that hadith and think and rethink and try to relive to the best of our ability, what happened then. So this is a battle, and it is said it is khaybar. But it is a battle, meaning that the Muslims had to march, had to get ready, had to travel. And what accompanies that is what? Fear and anxiety and hardship, and you're worried about your family, and you're worried about yourself, right? All these emotions are real, and you approach the polytheists or the non-believers, the enemies, and do you wonder to yourself, will I go back to my family? You wonder, why is it that they don't accept the truth? So it's, it's something real and it takes days or maybe weeks for us to reach this stage, this scene. And when the battle starts, and you now carry with you all that anxiety, anticipation, and the army of the non-believers, and you, and the fighting starts, and then among all the people who are fighting the kuffar, you find this Muslim. And this Muslim is brave, is inflicting harm, and he's protecting other Muslims. And the uh, battle is won because of him and people like him. And he's because of his deeds, he's protecting you and protecting other Muslims as well. And he seems to be so daring, he doesn't care about his life. How, what, what do you describe? How do you describe that person? What is he? Huh? He's brave, he's a hero. He's a hero, like you look at that person, and he's a hero. Look at him. Huh? Look at what he's doing. Look how, hel how he's helping. He's a hero. Now, Imagine hearing then the Prophet ﷺ saying he's in hellfire. The shock, right? Do you understand the shock? That is difficult to process. So it says in other narrations of the hadith, um, in the Sahih as well, قَالَ حَتَّى كَادَ بَعْضُهُمْ أَنْ يرتاب, That when they heard that from the Prophet ﷺ, some were about to doubt. Because to them, to their minds, there's a contradiction. How could this person be in hellfire? Because something is wrong. So how could he be in hellfire? So they were about to doubt what the Prophet was saying. Because to them, what is apparent is that this person is a Muslim fighting. He could be killed. And it's just it doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute that he could be in hellfire. And there's a lesson in all of this. So that man who had heard this, who followed him, he said he decided to follow that man because so far he did not receive any visual confirmation that this person could be in hellfire. So he thinks to himself, what is it about this man that's going to send him to hellfire? So he followed him, followed him, followed him. This person continued to uh, behave and do well in battle until he gets injured. And then, as you said, he kills himself. And... That was the confirmation. Something that no one could know except Allah 
Azza wa Jal, and he had told his Prophet Sallallahu that's his end. That's what he has on the inside. But no one otherwise could know this. And that's why he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that a person could perform the deeds of the people of heaven as far as people could see. So one of the first lessons here that we have to learn is what you see is not always reality. Say, So you could, uh, absolutely, right? So you follow, right? So what you see is, you could see that this person is performing so well and is defending Islam. So as far as you could see is, he is a righteous person, he is a good person, but the reality, the inside is only known to Allah Azza wa Jal. That's why when you want to praise someone, what do you say? نَحْسَبُهُ كَذَا وَكَذَا I think him to be this and that. Because the certainty of knowing what is in his heart belongs to Allah Azza wa Jal. But you don't know. What does he have in his heart or in her heart? As far as you can see on the outside, he's righteous, he prays, he gives zakah, he gives da'wah, this, this, this. The inside, I leave it to Allah Azza wa Jal. So here, you don't always, or you can't always trust your perception. You could see that someone should be in Jannah, but he is not. And that shock is real. So even if at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, if some people at then that time could doubt that could happen today more so, that people could doubt that even more so today. For instance, an example that we can learn from today is that suppose to kind of like bring this closer to home suppose that hypothetically there's someone who defends Islam right defends Islam um, I don't mean physically I mean in speech in writing and you look at him and he is a great defender of Islam Suppose then hypothetically, and you love him so much, so suppose hypothetically, after some time, he starts to waver. Suppose hypothetically, after some time, he strays, and he rejects Islam altogether. What does that do to you? Shakes your iman, doesn't it? Absolutely, it's a fitna. And it's hard because this person who is a defender of Islam and you've invested so much of you in him emotionally, you're connected to him. All of a sudden, not, maybe not all of a sudden, but maybe to you it seems like unprecedented. He moves from this to the opposite and he loses faith. What does that do to your faith? Undermines it. And here is where you start or have to emphasize that I'm worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, not people. And I'm following Muhammad وسلم, not people. So any da'iyah, and this is, this is an important for you to acquire independence in terms of emotional independence. Any da'iyah is guiding you to the Prophet وسلم, Where is that da'iyah to deviate, he deviates. Were he to abandon, he abandons. But you do not lose your faith in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa because he's only a guide and a messenger to the messenger. You with me? He's only a messenger to the messenger. So you always have to remind yourself that I love him as long as he follows the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If he starts to waver, if he starts to compromise, then he will deserve less allegiance, less love in accordance with what he had wavered and what he had compromised. So it's important to remember this because we get attached sometimes to people and we forget that they're supposed to guide us to something that is higher and that is Allah and His Prophet. So that is one important lesson and we emphasize the other lesson which is what? That a person could be doing the actions of the people of heaven as far as people could see and enter hellfire. So in the case of this man, apparently he was doing the deeds of the people of heaven. He was doing what? Jihad. The greatest, like the pinnacle, Dhurwatu Sanam, the pinnacle, because you are endangering your own existence. You're sacrificing your own self. There's nothing greater than that. You can sacrifice time. You know, what SubhanAllah, we sacrifice time, we think that we've done a lot. We've sacrificed a little bit of money. We think that we've done a lot. This is a person who is willing 
apparently to sacrifice his own self. So you would think to yourself, this person should be the first to enter Jannah, right? How does he end up in hellfire? Then, then there must be something missing on the inside. Because apparently, heaven. Inside, that's a different story. And when your outside doesn't match the inside, the inside fails you. Right? The inside fails you. Now, we don't know this man. Was he a hypocrite? Meaning he was simply fighting on behalf of his tribe because of certain allegiances? Or was he a Muslim, but he panicked and he killed himself? And because of that, he deserved hellfire. We don't know. And the beautiful thing about the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, is that they didn't ask. And there is beauty and an art form and adab manners to questions. And this is something to learn actually from this hadith as well. That if you have the ability to ask anything, does not mean that you should ask anything. You with me? Like you could ask anything, right? Does it mean you should ask? You should be selective. And ask about what benefits you. So asking whether this person was a kafir or a Muslim may harm his family. You follow? Could harm his family, disgrace his family, deeply sadden his family. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't volunteer and say he's in hellfire because he's a hypocrite or he's in hellfire because he committed a major sin. He just said hellfire. So for the Sahaba who don't want to harm other Muslims, and who understand that the Prophet spoke and he said what they need to hear, they simply closed the issue. They simply closed it. Now we know enough. I don't need to go to the Prophet ﷺ and say, oh, Prophet of Allah, was he a kafir? Was he this? Was he that? You don't need to know that. So ask about what benefits you. So there are manners to questions. So before you ask any question, say to yourself, do I need to know about this or not? And why? Huh? So there are manners to questions. And this also, this hadith teaches you apprehension, fear of what came, may come. So it negates arrogance and also gives person hope. So in the sense of a righteous person, you can never look at what you're doing and say, this is it, I'm guaranteed Jannah. Because right? you do not know how all of this will end. And only when you know how that will end and you never know, only then can you be secure. So if your end is La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, then alhamdulillah, that is a great end. If your end is you are doing something pleasing to Allah and then you die, then that is a good end. But if a person is doing something good and then they abandon that and they do the opposite and die like that, it tells you that the good that they were doing was missing something. What was it missing? Maybe ikhlas. Sincerity. Maybe ikhlas. Maybe there was no sincerity in it. Maybe there was a hidden sin that that person just kept to himself and did not treat and continued to grow until it defeated him. And so he abandoned faith. Maybe he tempted himself. Maybe he accepted fitna. Maybe, maybe, maybe. There are a lot of things that could be a play. But at this particular moment, if Allah had... Uh, guided you to do something good, you should be pleased with the fact that Allah had guided you, but also worried of what will happen tomorrow and the day after or the day after. How will I die? So part of the things that you should ask Allah Azza wa is husnul khatima. To have a beautiful end. Have a beautiful death. Death upon the Quran, the Sunnah, death upon Islam. That the last thing that you would say is La ilaha illallah. That Allah would maintain your iman until the end. That Allah Azza wa would not let the shaitan attack you or not let whatever your weaknesses you have grow and defeat you. So it does give you fear of Allah Azza wa and negates arrogance. You can go to hajj, you can give zakah, but you say, Ya Allah, accept from me. And you hope that this will continue to be this case until you die. 
to those who give what they give and their hearts are apprehensive. So Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who are those people? Are they the sinners? He says, no, they are the righteous who give and they're afraid that it's not going to be accepted from them. So the righteous and those who achieve a certain level of righteousness, taqwa, they, their fear is al-khawateen. What will happen with the khawateen? What will happen with my, when I want to die? So everything that they do, they hope with Allah Azza wa Jal that it would maintain that momentum and they know that tawfiq, that success is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. It gives hope also for those who may be sinful. Not, not uh, false hope or false wishes, but hope that a person could be the doing, doing the actions of the people of hellfire. But there is something good in them. There is something good in them. They love Allah. They love His Prophet wasallam. They make dua. Somebody made dua for them. Something, there is something there. And then they enter Jannah because towards the end of their life they change. Or maybe people's perception. People look at him and they say, he's not a good person. But between him and Allah Azza wa Jal, there is something. And Allah is pleased with him. And he goes to Jannah. And at the end he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَإِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِخَوَاتِيمِهَا Indeed deeds are by their conclusions. So, whoever says la ilaha illallah and it ends like that, Allah Azza Jal will give him Jannah. If your last thing that you say before your death is la ilaha illallah, you will enter Jannah. Now, is it easy to say la ilaha illallah at the end of your life? No. So how do you get ready for it? By living it now. Right? Because think to yourself, this person, Let's assume that he was Muslim. Okay? When he got injured, what happened to him? He panicked. And when you panic, what did he do? He killed himself. Now, you may th say, say to yourself or think to yourself, well, I mean, at death, I'll have the presence of mind and the strength of heart. I'll say, la ilaha illallah. But you're going to be panicking. Or if something else happens, you may deviate like that person deviated and do something that you will regret. What is the thing that is going to hold your heart in place? Tathbeetul qalb, the steadfastness, the stability of the heart. What is the thing that is going to hold your heart in place? Similarly, also to those who have heard the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, this person is in hellfire. Now, like, to them, it didn't make like, how could I reconcile this? What is the thing that is going to make you believe the Prophet ﷺ, even when your senses are against it? It's not easy to have faith even when you're being challenged. So the thing that will keep it in place is iman, is taqwa right now. Right? So that when something heavy comes later, you'll be able to carry it. You know like how you go to the gym and exercise? So that when you actually need to carry something heavy, you can carry it. So when you train yourself now and you lean on Allah Azza wa and you ask for His support and you acknowledge your own weakness but you keep asking Allah to preserve your faith when something catastrophic, unexpected happens Allah Azza wa will hold your heart in place and it will not shake. And you'll be able to withstand that test. But if there is a flaw in the heart you'll panic. And an, an easy, simple example is that you think that you're patient. I think I'm patient. I think I'm a strong person. Then all of a sudden, you lose your job. What happens to you? You panic. Right? Where is money, where is, is money going to come from? How will I live? How will I pay my rent? What is going to happen to my... You panic. So where does that come from? Because the heart is not ready for it. Whereas a person whose iman is strong... He could lose his job. Yes, it will challenge him, but he will come back soon to say, Allah will provide. Inna lillahi wa inna lihi raji'un. So that return is quick. So a person who is injured, like that person, and it hurts, and death or suicide is a quick end, quick solution. What is going to stop you from committing suicide? 
recognizing that this is something that if you do, may doom you when you meet Allah Azza wa So if the fear of Allah is greater than the fear of that unknown next day or two or three, you're not going to kill yourself. You'll be patient. Until Allah is the one who decides to take away your soul. Or you're not panic when you lose a loved one. Or you're not going to panic when you lose your job, source of income. Why? Because you always fall back onto Allah is there. But you have to have that in your heart for it to make sense. Otherwise, you'll be looking in your heart and around you for support and it's not there because you have not built it. You have not practiced it. And similar to that is that doubt that some Muslims had. The Prophet ﷺ said, he's in hell. How could that be? So if you don't have Iman, you may doubt the Qur'an. Right? You may doubt Muhammad ﷺ. Unless you do what? Unless your Iman is strong enough that you say, I'll re-examine what I understand. I'll re-examine my eyes and ears and not doubt the Qur'an and Sunnah. At least I'll suspend judgment and say what I've seen and what I heard is questionable. But what Allah has said and what His Prophet have said are not. I'll believe in this and I'll search for confirmation for the other until I find it. Like that man. Because that man to him, okay, the Prophet said something, must be true. What I'm seeing doesn't fit. What is missing? So you investigate. Now, you don't always need to investigate. Some things are beyond investigation. But that man was able to because that man was in front of him. He investigated, pursued, and he saw in front of him that he had killed himself. And he said, Sadaqa Rasulullah. He spoke the truth. There's no way that you could have known about this, you know, unless you're a prophet of Allah. And if you believe that he's a prophet of Allah, then his knowledge goes beyond what you see. Sahih? And beyond what you have experienced. So for instance, in one of those other hadith, um, the Prophet ﷺ told Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu that you will be fighting a particular sect that is called Al-Khawarij. And a sign among them is that you are, there is going to be among them a man and he looks like this, this, this. So when Ali ibn Abi Talib fought Al-Khawarij, this is when he was a Khalifa radiyallahu anhu, and among the dead, he said, look for this man that the Prophet ﷺ told me about. They go and they look for him among the dead. They come back and they said, we couldn't find a man with that description. He said, go again and look for him. The Prophet spoke the truth. Just look better, deeper. Um, and they went and they looked again and he was under another man. So they extracted him, like took him out, and it fit the description of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, Ma Rasulullah, the Prophet ﷺ did not lie. He was there. He knows that he's there. So if you believe Muhammad ﷺ, you are going to follow him, even at times when you don't fully understand. But ask Allah for that understanding, and Allah will grant you that understanding. Another also part of... Uh, some of the benefit of this hadith is that if people's perception is wrong, don't trust their praise. Right? That is, they may look at you and think that you are of the people of Jannah. And if you're going to have an image of yourself which is a reflection of what they're saying, you are deceiving yourself because their judgment is flawed. And if you're gonna, the opposite is true. Their judgment of you is flawed when they think that you're of the people of hell, and their judgment is erroneous. It's based on, you know, false evidence, it's based on a lack of information. But what is important is that you can't look at them and say, what you think of me is right, and what you think of me is my end. That's not true. So that's why they say, don't let the praise of people deceive you. You know yourself best. They know the best about you, right? And why do people know the best about us? Because that's what we show them. صح? That's what we show them. No one is going to come out of his house wearing all of his flaws, saying, look at my 
mistakes. No one, we all conceal. So they see the best of you, so they judge you based on the best of you, but you know the worst of you. So don't let their praise, their assessment deceive you. Right? And you know what the statement of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, uh, when he said, Allahumma ja'alni khayran mimma yadhunnoon. Uh, when somebody praised him, he said, Ya Allah, uh, don't hold me responsible for what they say and forgive what they do not know and make me better than what they say. Right? Don't, you I mean, forgive me for what they're saying. Like if they're saying something that is excessive, forgive me for that. And forgive, or don't hold me accountable for it. And forgive me for the things that are hidden that they don't know and make me better than what they're saying. That is a beautiful dua that frees you from people's praise and assessment. Of course, you want to have a good reputation, but at the same time, not be enslaved by it. Wallahu alam. So, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ Again, just to emphasize here, and I know, I mean, I've repeated this, but because it's important, how something ends tells you about how it started and how it was in the middle of it. If a salah has ikhlas in the beginning, ikhlas in the middle, it's likely to have ikhlas at the end. If a person has sincerity beginning and middle, he's likely to continue with that sincerity at the end. If a person is, has righteous in the beginning and middle, he's likely to continue that righteousness at the end. If something is flawed in the beginning and middle, that flaw will show itself clearly at the end. Clearly at the end. And that's why the khawatim, the end of everything, reveal the, the, reveal the nature of our deeds and the nature of our lives. Wallahu alam. The following chapter, chapter, this is number 33, Babun al uzlatu rahatun min khullati su. He says, solitude, being away from people. Solitude is comfort and relief from bad company. So that's the title that Al-Bukhari rahimahullah gave. And under that uh, heading, he said, or he narrated rahimahullah, two hadiths. Someone comes to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Ya Rasulallah, O Messenger of Allah, ayyu nasi khair, who are the best or who is the best of people? So they're asking who's the best, right? And that is an Arabi. A Bedouin, a nomad, comes to the Prophet O oh Prophet of Allah, who is the best of people? So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rajulun Jahada bi nafsihi wa malih. He says, a person who made jihad with himself, with his self, and with his wealth. Warajulun fi shi'bin min as shi'abi ya'budu rabbahu wa yada'un nasa min sharrih. And a man who is in a valley, in a valley. A valley is, you know, something that is between two mountains, a path between two mountains. في شعب من الشعاب He, in that valley, he worships Allah and he protects people from his evil. Keeps away from protecting people with his evil. So, in response to the question, who is the best? The Prophet ﷺ gave two types of people. The first is one who does what? Jihad. Jihad with his self and jihad with his wealth. So that is a person who is active in the middle of people, talking to them, advising them, commanding good, forbidding evil. And where it needs to, he does jihad. He does jihad with his money and he does jihad with his body. So he's in the midst of it. The second one is a person who had withdrawn from people. That's al-uzla, that's solitude. He withdrew from people. Fi shi'bin min al-shi'ab. He's in a valley. Meaning away from people. What does he do in that valley? Ya'budu rabbah. He's worshipping Allah. That's the reason why he's there. Ya'budu Allah. He's worshipping Allah. Wa yada'u nasa min sharrihi. He's protecting people from his evil. Meaning he doesn't harm anybody. That is the second best. Now, why was the first the very best? And that's why he comes first, right? Who is the best? He says, Rajulun Jahada. Because that person who is a mujahid does two things. Reforms himself and he reforms other people. Teaches himself and teaches other people. And that is the greatest benefit for those who can do that. 
And as long as you can be around people and you can teach, and it could be your family, it could be your friends, it could be your neighbors, then that's the best. You're trying to be patient and you command patience. You try to be kind and you command kindness. You go to the masjid and you take people to the masjid. Um, you're spreading righteousness as much as you can. And yes, that's jihad. And as long as you are surviving and you are winning, then you are among the best. You're struggling, but you're among people. The second category is someone who's practicing this solitude. This is someone who couldn't do what the first person is doing. He couldn't do that jihad. He couldn't fix himself and fix others. So the option is either he is in the midst of people and he gets corrupted. Okay, he cannot protect himself from evil. Or he withdraws. And when he withdraws, he is better than when he's among people. Because he could withdraw and what? Be lost. And you can go to a village. You can go, you know, to uh, the wilderness and lose your faith. Forget about Allah. For, because there's no one around you to remind you. There is no adhan, there is no salah, there is no halaqa, there is nothing. So a person like that withdrawing into the wilderness where there's no one around him, he will lose himself and he will lose his faith. He's not allowed to do that. But this person is strong enough that he has enough knowledge, he has enough practice, he has enough devotion that when he moves away from people, he can worship Allah Azza wa Jal and at the same time doesn't harm anybody around. That the Prophet وسلم, has praised. But this should happen only when right, that person had given up on the fact that he could be around people. And that person doesn't have other obligations. He doesn't have family. He doesn't have people that he should take care of. And also he shouldn't withdraw so much that he does not attend any salah or does not attend any jum'ah and does not get any reminders. Moving away that, that is excessive. But there are certain circumstances, especially towards the end of time, as the next hadith will explain, where that could be justified. But in the world that we live in today, what you need from this hadith, with this particular hadith is you could be one of two people. One who tries to fix himself and fix others. And that is the best if you can. If you're unable to do this, then at least take care of yourself. And don't harm other people. So those are the two levels that we're talking about. We don't recommend to people at this moment that you move to the wilderness or move to the jungle and worship Allah alone. You haven't reached that stage yet. Although there will be times when that will be the best thing to do. Evidence is the next hadith. Where he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, يَأْتِ عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ خَيْرُ مَالِ الرَّجُلِ الْمُسْلِمِ الْغَنَمْ يَتْبَعُ بِهَا شَعَفَ الْجِبَالِ وَمَوَاقِعَ الْقَطْرِ يَفِرُّ بِدِينِهِ مِنَ الْفِتَنْ He says, there's going to come a time upon people that the best money that a man will have will be sheep. Meaning he will be a shepherd. And there will be sheep. يَتْبَعُ بِهَا شَعَفَ الْجِبَالِ He will take them to the mountain tops and where the rain drops. يَفِرُّ بِدِينِهِ مِنَ الْفِتَنِ He's running away, saving his religion from fitan. So there is enough fitna for that person that he abandons society altogether. And what is his money? What is left? The only thing that he has? غَنَم Sheep, cattle, animals. Because that makes him sufficient. Right? It produces meat, it produces milk, he doesn't have to interact with people, he doesn't have to depend on anybody else. It is him and Allah Azza wa Jal and the rain and grass. That's it. And is this an easy life, by the way? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So, in general, when you're going to withdraw from fitna, you are going to be challenged. When you're going to separate yourself from temptation, you are going to be challenged. And one of the things that we want to learn from this hadith is that it is incumbent, it is necessary to separate yourself from the fitna. But first of all, let's understand what is the kind of time where this is justified. So the time of Ad-Dajjal, for instance. You know when the imposter, Messiah, the imposter, Dajjal descends 
And he takes control of almost every place on this earth except three places, Mecca, Medina, and Al-Quds. You can't fight him. What do you do? You run away from him. Where do you run away to? The mountaintops. You hide. Because you can't fight him. There are other instances, right, where there will be so much fitna where you're afraid. Like, let's suppose in a city, hypothetically, or in a country. People start killing each other. So if you're in that city, you're either going to be killed or you have to kill someone. What's the best thing to do? Leave. That's a fitna that we're talking about. Or in a city or in a country where they're going door to door, especially if you're Muslim. You're either going to reject Islam or we will kill you. You're either going to do this or we will kill you. What should you do? Leave, run away. Run away to the jungle, to the desert, to this and that. That is the type of thing that the Prophet ﷺ is talking about. And as you get closer and closer to the Day of Judgment, more of this will happen. That a person will need to run away to save his religion. And by the way, he's not running to save, away, to save his life. That's not what the Prophet said. He's not running to save his life, or to save his family, or to save his kids, although all these things are valid. He says, save his religion. And that tells you that that's something precious for that person. And I mean, Allah Azza wa make religion something that precious for us, that you actually would move to save it. Because we would definitely move to save money. Right? Definitely, right? Like if you're thinking of buying a house or you're renting and you discover that this is a better, cheaper neighborhood, what happens? Boop. Immediately move. Right? Why not? Better investment. But when it comes to faith and religion and Islam, we're not as motivated. You don't move for the sake of faith. Or you get closer to the masjid or there's a better Muslim community or you'll be a, a, away from bad influences. You don't really consider moving for the sake of Allah Azza wa But this man had made this sacrifice. And this type of life is difficult. You could imagine that that person, if he were to say yes, maybe to that fitna, whatever that fitna may be, he could stay in his house, he could eat good food, he could be around his friends, he could have luxury around, and not have to live like this. Sheep that he has to travel with every day, maybe it rains, maybe it doesn't, maybe he has enough milk or not, it's a rough life. But if for the sake of Allah Azza wa he does it. Right? And that's the title of the chapter, Al-Uzlatu Rahatu Min Khullat al because in that solitude, he protects himself from bad influences and bad people and preserves his faith. Now, as I said, take what we take from that hadith is that you need and we need to put a distance between us and fitan. We may not do what he did because we don't need to do that at this moment. But we always need to put a distance between us and fitna. So consider what is the fitna in your life that is taking you away from Allah? What is the thing that is haram, that is invading your home? And see, did you and can you put a distance between you and it? So if it is something you visit online, can I block that website? Can I stop visiting it? Can I block the times where I'm more prone to visiting that website so that I don't see it? If it's a place in the city, can I avoid that place so that I put a distance between me and it? Not only a distance between me and it, between me and two other neighborhoods that will lead to that place. If it's a person, can I put a distance between me and that person? If it's whatever it is that is bringing you closer to the shaitan, that is a fitna, could you distance yourself from it? Even if you had to sacrifice something. Even if you had to sacrifice some halal to protect yourself from the haram, it's worth it. So distancing yourself from fitan is necessary. And al-uzlatu, rahatu min khullat al su that is solitude when it protects you from evil company is better than evil company. Now, not everybody can withstand solitude. But the scholars do advise some solitude as long as it is beneficial. So, you still need to attend Jum'ah, right? You still need to attend the Jama'ah. Attending study circles is good. 
being around family is a great balancing act. Having friends to talk to is comforting to the mind and body, right? Playing sports is good, right? Because you get to spend energy. Hobbies are good. All of that. To have a balanced life, it's necessary. But when do you need some solitude? If the company is bad, solitude. If the influence is bad, solitude. Or also, you need some time alone between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. For what? For dhikr. For dua. For Quran. For simply just to have some clarity on mind. You can't simply be or demand noise. I must have noise. I must have... Uh, I must be always be occupied, occupied, occupied. No, you have to be comfortable enough to be with Allah Azza wa Jal. And as long as that is beneficial, great. When you find that your solitude is causing harm, then you have to stop it. So solitude that causes harm is what? You sit with yourself and you find that the shaitan is playing with your head. Then you should do what? Stop your solitude. You know, go to your family, go to your friends, see the Quran, be in public. Just be in public so that you don't do something that you regret, that is sinful. Or those thoughts that are coming and knocking on your heart and saying you, this bad thing, that bad thing, you're bad, this bad, they stop. So solitude is good, but with moderation. And some people, you know, can do more of it and some people can do less of it, but you should be the final judge. And if you don't know, ask. If I'm, is, is what I'm doing right? Is I'm doing wrong? Should I do more of this, less of that? Ask. And Allah Azza wa Jal, if you truly ask Him, Allah Azza wa Jal will guide you. Now, the following one is Babu Raf'il Amana. This is the lifting or taking away of Amana. Amana is trustworthiness for a person to be trusted to practice it that's amana right and he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there are two hadiths here uh, three so he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إِذَا ضُيَّعَتِ الْأَمَانَةِ فَانْتَظِرُ السَّاعَةِ he says if trustworthiness is no longer there then wait for the day of judgment if trustworthiness is no longer present, meaning you can't trust people, wait for the day of judgment. They say, how is it not there? How will it be lost, O Prophet of Allah? He said, if matters of authority and power are given to those who do not deserve it, then wait for the day of judgment. So, al-amana, the lifting of amana, taken away of amana is one of the signs of the day of judgment and this here sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he explains ida usnida if matters of authority and power are given to those who do not deserve it that's an explanation of it that's an instance of it that's something that you could see so what does it mean power and authority are given to those who are not worthy of it now who becomes the king somebody who's qualified or unqualified unqualified the prince unqualified the president unqualified Prime Minister unqualified. So what does that mean? It means that the standards are upside down. That's the kind of the nature of the Day of Judgment is that things are wrong. Right? They're on their heads. Nothing is right. So when you start seeing that those who are worthy of the position are not given that position, and those who are unworthy of that position are those who get that position because people like them or that king gives it to those whom he likes and these people are just like him unqualified if you find that that's the case then things are going in the wrong direction and if things are going in the wrong direction it's overall telling you that you're coming closer and closer to the day of judgment because if things are okay you're far from the day of judgment when things become worse and worse and things turn on their head right is wrong wrong is right right then the day of judgment is approaching. And this thing has happened, you know, a long time ago. A long time ago, things were given to those who are not worthy of it. 
But the more that happens of it, the more that you see that the day of judgment is approaching. And you could see more of that today. The righteous, the good people, those who are qualified are denied these positions. And those who rise to the top politically and also in terms of fame are those who possess nothing to give. And they're clueless. So you look at it and you say, if they continue to run the world the way that they are running it today, they'll destroy it. And then eventually, it will be destroyed. So here, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that the lifting of amana, the disappearance of amana, is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. And in the following hadith, and it's a longer hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu explains how that happens, and that it is a gradual process of losing trustworthiness from the heart as you lose your iman. And that Iman and Amana are connected. And they should be connected. So he said, this is Hudayfa who narrates this hadith. He said, the Prophet ﷺ told us about two things. I've seen one of them and I'm waiting for the other. He told us the following. He said, Inna al-amana tanazalat fi jadri qulub rijal He says, Amana, trustworthiness, was placed in the middle of men's hearts. In the middle of people's hearts. Meaning that in your fitrah, you have amana. In your fitrah, how Allah created you, you love amana. Isn't it? Naturally, right? You love those whom you can trust. You seek them. You want them. So it's in your fitrah. Okay? قال ثم علموا من القرآن ثم علموا من السنة Then people after, you know, Allah gave them the fitrah of amana and he put also iman in their hearts. Then they've learned the Quran and learned the sunnah. Meaning they had this trust and they could be trusted. And when they learned the Quran, that was enhanced. When they learned the Sunnah, that was even enhanced further. So the Quran and Sunnah came and they solidified the fitrah. So a person who was trustworthy before Islam, with Islam he becomes what? Completely trustworthy. Because Allah pushes him to that, towards that. And the Prophet ﷺ recommends it. And he's afraid of punishment if he doesn't do it. So both of your fitrah and your uh, revelation, they meet together to support that good character of being trustworthy. Meaning that if you say something, you do it. Somebody trusts you to say th something, uh, you do it. You promise, you fulfill the promise. Nobody suspects you. Your word is gold. You say tomorrow, it's tomorrow. Right? And that, again, stems from your iman. And we may visit this, inshallah. وَحَدَّثَنَا عَنْ رَفْعِيَا And he said, Hudayfa, and he told us about how it will be taken away. So he said, يَنَامُ الرَّجُلُ النَّوْمَ فَتُقْبَضُ الْأَنْمَانَةُ مِنْ قَلْبِهِ فَيَظَلُّ أَثَرُهَا مِثْلَ أَثَرِ الْوَكْتِ He says, one, a person goes to sleep, and amana will be taken away from his heart, and there will be a trace left, mithla, on his heart, like a small trace that will leave on his heart. Meaning, some amana will be taken, but some will be left, and it will leave a trace on his heart because it was taken away. Then he sleeps again. Then amana will be taken more. It will be leave a trace like a blister. It becomes like a blister. Full. I mean, it looks like it's full, it's a bubble, but inside it's empty. And he gives here, sallallahu alayhi wa an example, gajamrin, like ember, that rolls on your leg and it leaves blisters. It has in it pus or it has in it um, liquid, but it's just empty really, okay? It's just shape, but there's nothing in it. فَيُصْبِحُ النَّاسُ يَتَبَايَعُونَ فَلَا يَكَادُ أَحَدٌ يؤدي الْأَمَانَةِ So in the morning, people sell and buy. But no one of them is, does that with trustworthiness or with amana. Right? فَيُقَالُ And it will be said, إِنَّ فِي بَنِي فُلَانٍ رَجُلًا أَمِينَ In the tribe of so-and-so is someone that you can trust. This is how scarce it is. In so-and-so, this is someone who, uh, that you can trust. وَيُقَالُ لِلرَّجُلِ مَا عَقَلَهُ مَا أَظْرَفَهُ وَمَا أَجْلَدَهُ وَمَا أَجْلَدَهُ And someone will be praised and they will say about a man how intelligent and wise he is. How eloquent he is, how strong he is. And he does not have a mustard seed of iman in his heart. 
قال حذيفة now says ولقد أتى علي زمان وما أبالي أيكم بايعت he says there was a time once upon a time I don't care whom I sell and buy from if I am buying or selling to a Muslim his Islam will propel him to be honest will make him honest and if I'm selling or buying from a Christian the one who has authority over him will make sure that he is honest but for today I will only sell and buy from so and so and so and so that Hudayfa, even at his time, radiallahu anhu, could witness the difference in amana. So, the Prophet ﷺ, going back to this hadith, and I know it's a long hadith, so I'm going to try, inshallah, to summarize the lesson that is in it. That Allah had given people amana, and amana and iman, by the way, the root is the same. Okay? It's similar. And when the root of something is similar in the Arabic language, it tells you that they are connected. If you have iman, you have amana. So, mu'minu It says, a mu'min, the Prophet ﷺ defined it in one hadith, is how people feel secure when it comes to you. I mean, when it feels secure about their wealth and um, honor when it comes to you. Meaning you're not going to take their wealth and you're not going to attack their honor. Meaning you can be trusted. So, why are you trusted? Because Allah Azza wa Jal is watching, right? What makes you ameen is what? Allah is watching. And I know that if I attack this person or take something of theirs, Allah will hold me responsible. If I lie to them, Allah holds me responsible. If I sell something and cheat them, I'll have to answer for that. In the dunya and in the akhirah. If I escape it in the dunya, I won't escape it in the akhirah. But you also actually will see it in the dunya as well when you cheat. So I can't lie. I can't cheat. If I promise... I might better fulfill my promise because if I don't, that's a sign of hypocrisy. So you find that all of Iman is pushing you to be a trustworthy person, an honorable person. But then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Amana will be taken away. So why is Amana taken away? Because of what? Lack of what? Iman. So when you start losing your Iman, and the Quran does not matter to you, and the Sunnah doesn't matter to you, and the hereafter does not matter to you, you could lie, right, when you sell, and you could lie when you buy, and you can lie when you repair things, and you can lie when you promise. Who cares? Because now your motive is what? I want to make money. And I'm not afraid of anybody or anything, unless somebody checks, unless there's a law, and unless, you know, the law I means uh, the law is strict enough, strong enough, and somebody is enforcing it, but otherwise, I don't really care. I only want to make money. So there is no raqib, there's no watcher. So he said it becomes gradual. You sleep, or a day passes, or a month passes, and your eagerness to be trustworthy decreases. And it leaves a small trace. And you don't feel it. And then, sometimes the time passes, and more of the amana is taken away. And when that time when it's gone, it leaves a trace, like a blister. And the thing, a funny thing about a blister, it's that according to the description of the hadith, muntafikha, it's swollen, but it doesn't have anything of use inside of it. So is a person who is untrustworthy. Big. Big, but he's what? Empty. Okay? We have the best merchandise here. I just got it, you know, wallahi, it cost me this and that. Big. Uh, the speech. Okay? The pretense. The claims. Like if you are unfortunate enough to watch advertisement today, all of it is like this. Wallahu alam, except, you know, a little bit maybe. That is, would be an exception. But all of it, big claims about this cures, this heals, this will make you happy, you really need this. Big, big claims. And when people talk about themselves, they exaggerate. And it's all of this, it's like a blister. What's inside? It's empty. Tarahu muntafikha. You see it blown up. There's nothing in it. So he said, So people sell and buy, no one is trusting the other. This person is lying and that person is lying. That This, wallahi, cost me this and that, I'm not making any profit. This person, wallahi, I don't have money, wallahi, this. Both of them are lying. No one trusts the other. And it becomes a game, right? It becomes a game. You know him that he's lying and he knows that you're lying. And no one trusts the other person. And... فَيُقَالُوا إِنَّ فِي بَنِي فُلَانٍ رَجُلًا أَمِينًا It will be said 
Like people will, will be transferring to each other. In the land of so-and-so, in the tribe of so-and-so, there is a trustworthy person. This is like if you want to hire someone today. Right? Can you just go and hire anybody? Okay, I, wanna, I want a mechanic. Can you just go to any mechanic? Or I want a uh, contractor. Any contractor? No. You ask, whom can I trust? Because I know that most of them may not be, I may not be able to trust them. So where? So, so and so. In that, that area or in that area, he can be trusted. That's like what he's talking about. In that area, that person you can trust. Means that the rest, no. Right? You can't. So a man has lost. And someone will be praised. I mean, who's praising him? People are praising him. MashaAllah, this person, he is so wise. MashaAllah, this person, look how well he speaks. MashaAllah, this person, look how strong he is. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, MashaAllah. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he doesn't have a mustard seed of Iman in his heart. So again, people's praise. Because the standards have been corrupted. Who's good and who's bad? Huh? Who's good and who's bad? If it's according to people, it's a person who doesn't have Iman in his heart. Whereas the person who has Iman in his heart may not be as eloquent and may not be as strong as this person. But he's a good person inside of Allah Azza wa But to people, he's not. So again, you cannot trust someone's praise if that person is not worthy of giving praise. Is not worthy of giving praise. That if a person who's praising is a scholar, is a righteous person who looks at it the way that Allah wants you to look at it, then yes, go ahead. Okay? Believe that. But if it is not, it comes from a corrupted standard, you cannot really believe it. And so you see even the world today, those who are praised and celebrated are those who have nothing in them to give. And those who actually have something are those who are ignored. But again, that's because amana had been lost and power and authority and attention is given to those who do not deserve it. And he's then finally he said, uh, عنه, he said, there was once upon a time, I didn't ask whom I would buy and sell from because I could trust everybody. Like at the time of the Prophet وسلم, at the time of Abu Bakr, at the time of Uthman, it doesn't matter. Imagine a society where that is the case, where you would go and buy bread, buy uh, barley, rent somebody, I mean hire somebody to do something and all of them can be trusted. Imagine that. No one is going to gouge you, no one is going to lie to you or tell you it cost me so much and it didn't. Inflate the price, no one is going to lie to you. But then he reached a stage and a time عنه, where he said, now, I will only deal with this and that. Hi. This and that. Wallahu a'lam. There's one single hadith left, but I will leave that, inshallah, uh, to, the, to next week, inshallah, just to see if you have questions regarding anything that we've just said. Barakallahu feekum. inshallah. Anything you would want to add, fadl? Naam, so that's a good question, Barakallah Fiqh. So the question is, the one who commits suicide, does he go to Jahannam forever? So a person is Muslim, and they commit suicide, they've committed. So committing suicide is an act that is a major sin, kabira, right? And any act that is a major sin um, could take the person to hellfire, or it could be forgiven. That a person could do other things that counterbalance, outweigh that big sin that he did. Or a person may not be able to do that, and so in the scale of deeds on the day of judgment, he will have more bad deeds than good deeds. When that happens, two, two, uh, two things could happen, or three things could happen. Allah Azza wa could see that he has more bad deeds, decide to take him to hellfire. So he'd be purified, and once he does his time, he comes out and he goes to Jannah. So if you commit a major sin, only major sin, you're not a kafir, you don't stay in hellfire forever. So Allah Azza wa could decide to punish him for some time and then take him out of uh, hellfire, put him in Jannah. Or Allah Azza wa could decide to forgive him. 
Or Allah Azza wa could accept the intercession of someone who comes and says, Ya Allah, forgive him. And Allah will accept that and he doesn't enter, gen uh, I'm sorry, hellfire. Or he spends a little bit of time and then taken out. But just to answer your question, if a person commits a major sin, he does not, and he's Muslim, he doesn't spend eternity in hell. He has to come out of it. And suicide is a major sin. Wallah. Let's answer your question, right? No. Right, so yeah, the comment of the brother of is that there's also a lesson in that hadith about the madman killing himself, about the destiny, about the qadr of Allah Azza wa and how Allah had destined all of this, that it was going to happen. Of course, it does not negate, as he said, uh, the free will that that man had. He is the one who decided to go to battle, he is the one who decided to fight, and he is the one who eventually decided to kill himself and end his life. But it does tell you about how Allah Azza wa Jal decrees things and that the Prophet Sallallahu as he said, he had a glimpse of what's going to happen and he told about, those, about what's going to happen. So uh, it's, it's in a sense important here to see the power of Allah Azza wa Jal and the knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal that how he knows what is going to happen before it happens and he informs his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the same time, right, uh, the fact that that man did what he did, he wasn't forced in any way to do it, yet uh, he did it because he wanted to do it, otherwise he would not be responsible to do something he was forced to do. So that summarizes it. Yeah. Of course, absolutely. And you could see it there because in many things that we do, you could see that you could stop or you could proceed. You could end or you can uh, begin. So you do. Yeah. So you see that you could do that. The only time where you would know that this had to happen is after the fact. After the fact, you would know Allah decreed it this way. But before, you even sense it in yourself that I, I have a choice now. I could go to work or stay home. I could go um, to masjid or I stay home. You, you feel that you have a choice. And at that moment, you know, you have the power, as far as you know, you have the power to go either way. After that is only that it's revealed to you that it's going to happen this way or not that way. Allah. Naam, of course, of course. There is a cause, right? There is a cause. It's tied to a cause. So you decide, you go to get into your car, you drive to the masjid, or you're lazy, you step back and you stay at home. It's all connected, of course, to things that you do or things you fail to do. Allah. Naam. Naam, naam, naam. Naam, naam, naam. Barakallah feek. Sahih. Sahih. Okay, inshallah. Anything else? Ah, tfadali. How can you trust? Can you repeat that but louder a little bit. How could you trust someone? Oh, 
okay, how could you trust someone, right? And know that he has amana, like so trust him with a deposit. Ah, uh, you don't know that person, so how can you trust him to know that he's worthy of that uh, deposit that you give to them? Um, you'd, you'd have to have enough experience with that person so that you know that he has enough faith and he has enough integrity and he has enough honesty and only knows if you know him, it only happens if you know him very well. You can't assume just because he comes to the masjid that that person is going to be trustworthy or just because he has some knowledge that he's going to be trustworthy. But you have, have some experience with him. You know that he's a muttaqi. You know how he lives. You see it in his character. And eventually, if you need to trust him, you base, make it based on that, on those kind of, um, on that evidence. Similar to, you know, an amana that you find, um, that you decide that this plumber, contractor, doctor, same thing. How, why would you give your body to a doctor? Okay, because he must have amana, otherwise you would never surrender your body to him. So you make the best judgment. He's graduated from here, he has this track record, there are laws to protect me, this, 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 I can trust. Right? So that's, that's how you decide, based on the evidence that you collect. And if you have enough of it, you can say, I'm comfortable and I can trust him. If not, they say, I can't find a person to trust. Wallahu alayhi Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you judge based on what you know, right? Inside is, is to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Tayyib. Zakumullah khaira. Now we'll see you inshallah next week. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa an. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaykum. Alhamdulillah.